This week, we interview Gavin Millard from Tenable Network Security, put an end to the Wake Up Marine meme, and talk about jamming our logs in the stories of the week. So stay tuned. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady, it's Paul's Security Weekly. Brought to you by Pony Express. Check out the Community Edition and turn your Nexus 7 into a lean, mean pen testing machine. For all those hard to reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at ponyexpress.com. And by Onapsis, the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at onapsis.com. Looking for a career change? Tenable Network Security is hiring everything from programmers to researchers. Check out all of the available positions at securityweekly.com forward slash Tenable Jobs. If you're listening to this show, check out the following two positions. Both are technical and both are work from home. Nessus Vulnerability Research Engineer and C Software Engineer. Now fire up a packet capture, pour yourself a beer, and give the intern control of your botnet... This is Paul Security Weekly, episode 419 for Thursday, May 14th, 2015, and I'm your host, Paul Asadorian. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. I am the only one here in studio because Jack and Larry both are traveling. Larry's in Austin, and Jack is somewhere stuck on an airplane somewhere. On the lines via Skype, did I say May 14th? Because that's what's in the show notes. Whatever you put on the teleprompter is what I'm going to read. Don't you? It is May 21st. We did not go back in time. It is May 21st. This is episode 419. I got that part right. Anyway, details. On the live stream. It does say it on the screen in front of me. On, it will get better from here or worse. I'm not sure which. On the lines via Skype, Mr. Joff Thayer from North Carolina. How are you? <laughs> G'day, Paul. How are you? It's good to be here again. And also from one of those Carolina states, South Carolina, we've got Mr. Michael Santarcangelo. Boom. You got it, brother. Boom. Hey, man. Nailed. Booyah. Someone said Mr. Santar, whatever the hell his name is. I'm like, you didn't even yeah. try. At least I tried. And, and you know what happens with practice? Eventually. Eventually. Yeah. But, you know, we got Santar Cangelo shots as a result of me mispronouncing your name, Mike. So there and you was said they good. were good, right? Yeah, there was so? good that came from it. And it had Jack Daniels um, in it. There was a little bit of Jack Daniel inside of the Santar Cangelo shots. And it had a good run feel. That's many levels. <laughs> I told you it would go downhill from here. <laughs> <laughs> Got a couple of announcements. Ready to learn combat firmware analysis. Register for my Black Hat course titled Embedded Device Security Assessments for the Rest of Us. A two-day hosted class at Black Hat Las Vegas. Registration includes breakfast, lunch, and access to the Black Hat briefings, business hall, sponsor workshops, and sponsor sessions, and the Arsenal Talks. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash IOT to register today and also get a few tips on reverse engineering firmware right on that same page. Securityweekly.com forward slash IOT. IOT. Mr. Santar Cangelo, myself, and John Strand are doing a webcast titled Cracking the Code How Security Nerds Become IT Leaders. Part one, titled From Penetration Testing Results to Improvement, is being held on June 10th, 2015, at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. You can get all the details, including the registration link, at securityweekly.com forward slash cracking the code. Very excited about that one. This week, we've got a very special guest, Mr. Gavin Millard from Tenable Network Security, joins us to shine a light on Shadow IT, talk about how to get things done in security, and several more topics related to all things security. Gavin, for those that don't know, is also the husband of Maureen, who you all may know from the popular security meme, on Security Weekly, rather, the meme, Wake Up, Maureen. Welcome, Gavin, to the show. Hello, mate. How are you doing? Good. I'm doing fantastic, Gavin. It's nice to have you on the show. I did want to start, and I wanted to put an end to the meme because Maureen and you are expecting a child in like the next few weeks or so. Oh, and literally days. How many? Uh, uh, about 
About 10 days. 10 days. So we want Maureen to get as much rest as possible. Therefore, I wanted to end the meme on Security Weekly because, you know, babies have a tendency to cry in the middle of the night. So mm -hmm. I, I bless you both. Thank you very much. Yes. yes. Very exciting. Um, so, uh, Gavin, you have a very diverse background. You are an ethical hacker and uh, you work in the EMEA office uh, here at Tenable Network Security. How did you get your start in information security? So, uh, I've been in the industry for quite a while. Uh, I think when I first started, uh, I could actually make styling decisions with my hair. Uh, unfortunately, obviously, <laughs> now I can't. In, in, fact, in fact, just for you, Paul, I actually pulled out two spotlights. Uh, oh, yeah, because there was glare on your head, wasn't there? Because there was glare on my head. Um, nice. So, yeah, I, I started off uh, as a developer uh, working for uh, an EPOS company. Uh, I was actually... Uh, creating the first Windows-based EPOS, which is a very glamorous title. And what is e e like point of sale? Yeah, okay. electronic point of sale. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I moved down to Cambridge, uh, became an IT manager. Uh, found that quite boring. And uh, luckily for me, the uh, the managing director or CEO of the company, he uh, put a lease line in and said, "You can only use this if you." actually managed to secure it. So I uh, spent a lot of time uh, figuring out how to do so. Uh, figured out pretty quickly that uh, to be able to actually secure uh, the connection, I needed to understand how people are actually breaking in. Uh, I can remember reading Hacking Exposed, I think it was version three, like massive tome uh, on a flight over to the US uh, and uh, started from there really. Um, then uh, once I'd got into it, realized you know, helping people he really shouldn't be touching keyboards. Touch keyboards um, was a very bad thing. Uh, moved more into the IT security side. Uh, started off uh, in the ethical hacking and penetration uh, testing part of the company. Uh, unfortunately, my business card actually said uh, professional services because uh, over in the UK, that's what we call it. Uh, and uh, my, my brothers found it gleefully funny to remove random cards and write, uh, 20 pound hand job, uh, 40 pound full service, and then put them back in my <laughs> cards. And so uh, I, I realized I had to get out of that. Uh, I had to change my title. And so uh, then moved into uh, working with uh, companies like Checkpoint, ISS when they were decent, uh, and uh, you know quite a few others, Crossbeam when they still existed. And Tripwire, um, was Tripwire your previous company before coming to Tenable? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then uh, then moved into Vendorland, uh, went to uh, work with uh, Tripwire for 10 years, uh, looking after the international business or you know if you're outside of America, anywhere outside of America. Um, and then I moved to uh, Tenable about 18 months ago. 14 months ago, maybe. So, Gavin, I want to ask you, since you're giving your background, kind of sparked a question. Yeah. Uh, what are the differences in the security industry or landscape between the U.S. Um, and the U.K.? So, you guys love threat intelligence. <laughs> uh, we, Wait, uh, you don't <laughs> love threat intelligence? Everybody drink. <laughs> yeah. Buzzword. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we... we, we um, so it's quite weird. We're sometimes quite behind. Well, yeah, uh, I mean, you're still driving on the wrong side of the road, but... Uh, I hey, believe Paul, it's the Paul, that's side. the left side of the road. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, Joff's obviously from Australia. He drives on the right side as well. Um, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we're, we're sometimes uh, trailing. Um, but I think nowadays there's, there's, uh, the delta difference between the US and the UK is actually quite small. Um, the only difference we have is quite often the companies that are started up in the US uh, take a little time to come over to Europe just because it's you know difficult to start businesses over here. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, gen generally we're, we're pretty close. I, I, I've been over to the States uh, yeah, an absolute ton of times and uh, don't really notice too much nowadays. Uh, if you actually look at the whole of Amir, there's some differences. You know, for example, the, the Middle East, they love to spend money on gadgets. Um, you know, uh, FireEye have done really well over there uh, just because, you know, basically they say, we'll solve your problems $2 million and they go, here's $2 million. But they don't do the basics of security. Um, and then you find in Eastern Europe, you know, those guys are just so switched on. Um, I can remember my first meeting I did in 
um, in uh, Poland, I was just blown away by their technical ability. So yeah, it kind of, it's, you know, EMEA is a very large area. There's differences all over. Yeah, and apparently it's okay that when you come over here to the United States and you see me in a bar, knowing that I, I didn't know at the time what you looked like, we'd only spoken <laughs> on the phone, to yell very loudly in the middle of the bar, oh my God, it's Paul from Security Weekly. I'm just like, yep, that's me. And then he's oh. like, hmm. so I was talking to me and he's like, oh, it's Gavin. I'm like, you, you could have, really? That's how, it was quite funny. I think I asked you to sign my tits. Yes, and then you asked me to sign your tits. <laughs> yes. And then I told you that it's me. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I've been drinking with salespeople. <laughs> no, it's just a lot of fun. Well, that's what I do when I see you in public, Paul. I, I yell out, it's, oh my God, it's Paul from Security Weekly. And... I, I think in a few years ago at ShmooCon, we actually signed Mark Baggett's chest. I think we, we did, did that. Did we really? I think we did. Oh, I don't think was I was before, there. Yeah, before your time, Joff, but... Um, well, your time here on Security Weekly. So, Gavin, you spend a lot of time recently talking about shadow IT. What, is that just a marketing term? Do we all need to drink when we hear shadow IT now? What, what is that all about? Yeah, most probably. Uh, so, um, in fact, I was actually over in the States a couple of weeks ago uh, at Forrester um, down in Orlando. Were you, were you yelling at random people in bars as well at Forrester? Uh, yes. Yes. I, I, I see like a pattern yeah. now. I see the yeah. pattern. John, John Kindervag and uh, other yeah, analysts. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I tend <laughs> yeah, I tend to yell after a few drinks. Uh, and um, you'll find out later. I've already had one. So, um, yeah, I, I, I was asked to speak at Forrester, and they didn't really tell me what to talk about. And uh, you know, one of the things that's been bugging me for oh, you know, maybe a few years now, really, is... You know, our lackluster approach to understanding what's actually running within the infrastructure. You know, I, I can remember when I first started in IT, when I was an IT manager, we actually used to debate what to, or it wasn't really a debate, it's, uh, you know, it was in, we're in the UK, so it was like polite conversation, but, you know, we kind of argued about what to name the next server. You know, it, we had a naming scheme um, named after uh, horses because we we're based out of a, a very famous race course. And, you know, it's like we are only adding a few systems at a time. But obviously that's changed massively in the last, you know, 10 or 15 years. And uh, yet we still seem to be stuck in this time where people have no idea what runs on their infrastructure. So, you know, I, I decided when I was over um, uh, speaking in front of a load of people to, to talk about, very, very simple security in reality, you know, gaining control, gaining a visibility into what's actually running within the infrastructure. So uh, I wanted to ask you, Gavin, Yeah. a lot of companies have a, when we talk about BYOD, because I, I, I think that somewhat relates to your concept of shadow IT, right? Yeah. When we talk about BYOD, there are companies that, and I was actually talking with uh, one of my, my good friends about this, and he kind of brought up this issue where we talked about the different ways in which people bring technology in the workplace and how they deal with it. You know, there's kind of the stick your head in the sand approach. People are going to use their own personal devices to access company resources, and uh, my head's in the sand and I don't care. And then there's companies that say, well, it's okay for per, you know, people to bring their own devices in. We'll just secure it on the back end and do some things that uh, are creative and secure it that way. And then there are other companies that are like, well, everyone's going to get a black phone. Or everyone yeah. that wants to use a mobile device has to have mobile iron, for an example, on their phone. Like, yeah. where, where, do we, where do we need to fall? I mean, obviously, those are almost three pretty good extremes. Where do we need to fall with this whole using personal technology in the workplace? Yeah, well, I think the head in the sand approach um, doesn't work, and we've seen that in the last few years. You know, when uh, you know Steve Jobs stood on stage in 2007, held up the iPhone and said, uh, "You know, this is going to change everything." He was right. You know, people mm. suddenly you know wanted to use their devices um, uh, within their infrastructures, and you know the the CISOs or the security directors, people that said no. no. Um, but then what 
what happened. They were circumvented and, you know, the, the, these devices end up everywhere. Um, for me, when I'm talking to organizations trying to deal with this problem, it's it, you have to embrace this or be circumvented because you will be circumvented. Um, you have to look at all of these devices connecting to your network and then you know, figure out how to actually protect the data at the back end, like you said. You know, organizations could roll out black phones, but the reality is it's so easy to connect to networks uh, when you're in the uh, infrastructure that you know, there's always going to be another device that you didn't know about. Um, you know, I, I, think it, I, yeah, I, I think it's really important that you identify all these things and, and classify them, um, but then also protect the data that's being accessed. Uh, yeah, otherwise, you, you just, <laughs> you're dealing with literally no knowledge of what's running on the infrastructure, which you know, 10 or 15 years ago would be unheard of. What are some ways in which people can protect their infrastructure if you're going to let employees use their own personal devices to access company resources? Yeah, well, I, I think the first thing is, you know, actually understand what, what's running on the network. Um, you have to understand what systems are there, what data resides on those systems, and then implement the correct controls. Now, you know, be it DLP or whatever, it doesn't really matter. The, the, the first thing is actually understanding where that data resides. And you know, although Do you find very... a lot of companies do that, Gavin? Or do it well? I think some people try, but I think it's a hard yeah. thing to accomplish, right? Yeah, well, it's quite interesting. I, I, I was sitting in a CISO dinner um, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, there was a, the CISO sitting next to me was the CISO for a massive uh, telecommunications company, you know, one of the biggest in the world. And uh, we started chatting away about uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, IT security. And uh, I said to him, what's your biggest problem? And he said, well, my biggest problem is assets and knowing who owns them mm. and knowing where the data is. And I said, well, where are you with that? You know, how well are you doing that? And he said, I'm doing a very shitty job of it and I need to improve it. Um, you know, all the CISOs that I speak to uh, and uh, the security directors I speak to are battling this problem. You know, it's, it's so difficult to actually understand what's running within the infrastructure. Implementing the right control to protect them is you know, a, a massive struggle for them. You know, I can remember I used to sell, you know, Tripwire, I used to sell a, a, an agent that was $1,000 per agent. You know, pretty, pretty spendy. And... I used to sit across from people and they say, oh, you know, so you can detect a single byte change on a file. And you're like, yep, yeah, we can do that. And so I'd say, right, well, how many servers do you want to protect with this stuff? And they'd say, well, I think we may have 300 or maybe 500 or maybe 700 servers. You know, they had no idea of how many, uh, how many uh, servers they were running, let alone where the data resided on those servers, yet they wanted to buy like premium controls to protect them. So, yeah, I think organizations generally really struggle with uh, identifying, identifying all the assets and, uh, and data within the infrastructure. Uh, and, you know, I think one of the reasons they do struggle is because they're kind of stuck in a 20th century approach. You know, uh, go back to the late 90s when probably most of us started in the industry. We would scan a network every month or, you know, every quarter or, you know, every year and we would take that snapshot and we'd understand where the data is. But, you know, those times are gone. You know, we're, we're looking at new systems popping up every couple of minutes or even every couple of seconds. So, you know, we need a different approach to doing this. Otherwise, we'll carry on struggling away. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting ahead, because Mike. we're talking about the shadow. Well, I was going to say is, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm thinking back to the late 90s, exactly that situation where if you wanted to turn up a new server that had to be in a data center, you had to get permission to use that floor space. You had to go buy the freaking hardware for it. I mean, we were still talking about hard drives in the gigabyte range. And if you got over 100 gigabytes, that was a special provision for it. But And, and even in that situation, I can remember walking around and, and you see uh, – and I won't pick on any department, but you'd see a server – on somebody's cubicle and you'd see silver duct tape all over the power switch saying don't turn this off attention people vacuuming don't use this circuit and that's kind of where you go what's going on and they go oh um you know we're using that for uh blah 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 you know, uh guys is that in production yeah 
Uh, you know, why Mike, is that not in the data center? That's such an interest. It's such an excellent point, Mike, because I, I, in some of my presentations, will talk about how easy it is to create new resources today, similar to Gavin's point. You know, you've got these things now called virtual appliances. So I can have an operating system, yeah. a server, applications, services running in the click of a button, and I've got this new application on my network. And I'm like, that's different from before. But what Mike just brought up is it's really not all that different from before because we've always had this problem of shadow IT. Yeah. But right in the, I think the late 90s and, you know, early 2000s, you know, early 2000s at a university, it might that exact same thing would happen. Someone had a problem. They had to solve it. They had a deadline. And so there's this, like, piece together box on their desk that all of a sudden they're like, oh, yeah, this is servicing in, in, you know, three departments within the university and it's serving a business critical function. And I'd go around and do a scan, and I'm like, what is that? I've never seen that before. So we've always had this problem. Yeah, but I I, I think the the difference is, though, it's the compound annual growth rate of those systems. Yeah, no no, no argument. The point I was actually going to make is that We've always had the problem, but, but as you've suggested, now it, it's a massive problem and, it, and it's gotten easier for somebody to be able to do it. So that actually kind of then leads me to a simpler question, which is unfortunately not simpler, it's just simpler to ask. We talk about BYOD, we talk about shadow IT. So what's the problem we need to solve? Um, and and mm. I, I, one of the things, Gavin, that you brought up that I, that I liked was people are excited about blight, uh, the, the shiny boxes and the blinky lights, and they're really excited. Oh, I can solve this, right? And right now we see a lot of excitement around threat intelligence. Oh, threat intelligence, that's the answer. And I always go, what's the question, right? It's kind of like watching Jeopardy here in the States. But we, we're also always quick to say, oh, and they don't even do the basics. Well, what the hell are the basics? I mean, it, if... What's the problem that we are trying to solve or what's the problem we need to solve here? I mean, from your perspective, if you were looking at an organization today just trying to wrap their heads around it, somebody's new in the, in, in the position, then they've got, let's say, a mandate. They've got some support. They've just brought in, hey, we need to take security seriously. What are the, what are the basics? Where do, they, where do they start? Yeah, great question. So, uh, in fact, actually, quite interestingly, I had a very similar question posed to me uh, after the Forrester event. And it was probably the, more uh, elegantly too. No, no, no. That was very elegant. Um, the uh, it was the CISO for uh, one of the top two hundred and fifty companies in the world, um, and she said, "You know, I'm, I'm the CISO, and they've given me remit to do pretty much whatever I want, um, but I don't know where to start. Where do I start?" And uh, I, I said to her, "And well, you said at the beginning, naturally." <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I said, uh, I said, well. You know, you've got to figure out what controls you want to implement and uh, you know, how you're going to measure the effectiveness of those controls. Um, so you know, if you choose to implement AV, um, you know, AV sucks. We all know this. We can probably argue about it over a drink. But um, you know, how are you going to make sure that whatever, if you implement that control, how effective is that control going to be across your infrastructure? How effectively have you deployed that control and how effectively is it reducing risk? Um, you know, so I look at always look at the SANS top four or top five uh, as as a guidance for where to start. You know, asset you know asset discovery is SANS control and one obviously, um, and then you know if I'm going to implement SANS control and one asset discovery, uh, what things should I measure to make sure that I'm doing a good job on that uh, to then implement the next control? And and I think well, you, you go on, go ahead. Let me. I'm sorry. I just um. So that's interesting. So. If we were looking for a framework for guidance, y- your suggestion is go use the top 20 controls. What, what sounds like whoever's doing it now. Um, would you tackle them in order? I mean, do you start at number one? Well, well I, no, I think what Gavin was saying was that he doesn't. He says, you know, find all your assets, but then find a way to implement controls to make sure you're doing that. And I think that's not in order or not what the SANS 20 okay. critical controls is saying. Right, Gavin? I yeah, so, about, uh, yeah, it, yeah, it depends what you're trying to protect as well. Um, and you yeah, know what? Actually, a, let's stop right there. I think that's actually the most important point. Yeah, yeah, that, I, I, think, yeah that, I think you just answered it, Gavin. I was going to chip in and, and yeah, drop, the, think, drop the mic. We're done. <laughs> I think there's there's three fundamentals. I mean, you know, number one is what are you trying to protect? Uh, number two is and where where is that data contained? Uh, what are the assets that data is contained on? Um, 
Uh, I think I said three, but th- th- those are the two biggies, right? Let me, let me give you the what third is it one. And where, where is, is it? it? Where does the data flow? Yeah, and where does it flow? Yeah. Can, flow can matters now full, in the mobile world. Can, can I give you the fourth? Yeah, and give us a fourth. Let's, let's build onto this. Let's do it. Um, how do you add value to the overarching business goals? I love so, that. You know, irrelevant of what you're doing, you know, if what you're doing does not add value to the overarching business goal of profit or whatever it is, helping sick kids or whatever, uh, then uh, it's pointless. You know, so the children are always important. That's a good one, by the way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it, it comes down to you know, if you're trying to mitigate security risk, then you're mitigating the wrong thing. The only thing you should be mitigating is business risk. Uh, and quite often when I talk to uh, companies, you know, they're, they're really focused on like the next big bug du jour, you know, the next big problem. Oh, you know, heart bleeds a real big problem or, uh, you know, or, you know, shell shock or. Logjam. You know, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Venom. Yeah, 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 venom. Yeah, awesome. Um, yeah, and it's like, this is a really big problem. It's like, well, why is it a problem? Yeah, how is it actually impacting the business? Yeah, Bingo. why would you actually patch this uh, when you could actually cause a detrimental impact to the business itself? Um, I, I can remember, I, I went to a big retailer, the, the, now one of our large customers, and uh, it was November last year. Uh, there's a couple of massive vulnerabilities that came out uh, with uh, Microsoft MS 1466 and uh, 68. So you know, one of the biggest ones was a domain uh, privilege escalation. I don't know if you remember that one. It was basically if you had credentials, you could become admin very, very easily. And uh, I said to the guy, uh, you know, the uh, security director, are you going to patch this? And he said, no. I was like, well, you're a really smart guy. Uh, I'm interested to know why you're not going to patch this. And he said, well, it's November. Um, you know, we're trying to sell lots and lots of things over the Christmas period. We're going to wait till January or February. I'm going to take the yep. risk mm-hmm. of somebody, somebody uh, using this floor, which might happen. Uh, but if I uh, patch you know, the 10,000 uh, point of sale devices within our infrastructure against this vulnerability, I'm out of a job. Because you know they could go down for hours or days, and it would cost me an absolute fortune. Probably more than a breach would cost. Exactly. Yeah. You know what's great? I I just want to amplify that because I, I had a similar lesson uh, early early in my career, still late '90s. So this was back when you know you you'd have to pay to have a line dropped, and it was a bank, and my team came in and we did the full assessment. And we came back, and it was like you know how much risk? Oh, it'll be a million dollars of risk. And they all listened really politely, sitting around the table, and they said, all right, cool, let's do it, let's go, let's, let's drop the line and get going. And I was like, well, well, did you guys not hear me? I said, I said a million dollars. They're like, Dude, we heard you. But the guy was really polite, and he's like, Michael, um, just, sit, just stay, we'll have a chat afterwards. I, I got gotcha. you. And I was like, okay. This guy's the head of an investment bank, right? So we're sitting there. He's like, all right, listen, your team did a great job. I really appreciate it. He said, you just told me how much risk I have. I go, I have a question. What do you think? Oh, it was right at a pivotal moment in, in Mike's oh. lecture when we lost him. What happened? You, we lost you for a second, Mike, right at a pivotal, pivotal moment in your oh. life. Cliff, I, was, I, was building, I was building up the suspense. You were. And, and, and so the head of the investment bank, he's like, you, you, what's your likelihood of this happening? He's like, if you had to put money on the table, what do you think? I was like, not, not much. Like maybe, maybe this will cost you like $200,000 over the course of a year, maybe. He's like, right. You know what you didn't ask me? how much money I'll make. Boom. You're right. I said, all right, well, how much money you'll make? He's like, at least $10 million in the next 90 days. He's like, so million dollars of risk, totally worth it to me. Yep. So but, is but, that, but is that he did. Well, hold on. There's, ahead, there's a caveat to this. That I think it's equally important. He then said to me, I'll tell you what though, you think that this risk might be worth about $200,000? He goes, listen, I believe you. What if I give you and your team $200,000 to go fix it? You think that'd be cool? He goes, I'll give you 90 days. What do you come up with? I was like, well, uh, yep. And we did. And it was great. And everybody was happy. So, so what, the, the, what I've always taken away from that is we always have to ask somebody, what's the benefit, right? Gavin said, are you adding value? Yeah. What's the value? What, like, you're trying to do something. I'm not just going to tell you no. I'm going to do my best to quantify a risk. But what I loved about him was, hey, I'm, I'm willing to make an investment. And I think that's something we could get better at when somebody says, well, we're going to do it anyway. I go, great. Can we take a percentage of that profit? and reinvest it in protecting that profit. Not reducing the risk, not some technical jargon. You wanna make money? We want you 
to make money. Oh, we lost Mike again. <laughs> yeah, and j just to uh, just to add to that, um, go ahead, Gavin. Yeah, I I, I was asked uh, for a comment uh, uh, six months ago in, uh, in in one of the publications over here, and the headline was, you know, J.P. Morgan spending two hundred fifty million dollars a year on security. It's like this is a crazy amount of money that they're spending, and so before I commented, I you know did what people like us should do and actually did some research. And uh, it turns out that the $250 million they spend on cybersecurity is to actually protect $12 trillion of assets. You know, so, yeah, to, to me, that, that's simple, simple math. I, I, you know, if I've got $12 trillion worth of assets, I'm more than happy to spend $250 million to protect that. By the way, I don't have $12 trillion worth of assets. Uh, you look like you do in your uh, natty outfit. You look, you oh, look well, like you may have well, twelve thank you. trillion. <laughs> yeah, not even close. But you know, I can dress the part sometimes, uh, and get ash all over myself as well. What is the intersection between threat modeling and risk management? And do you see organizations doing both together like that? Because I feel like that's one of the things that we all kind of suck at. Yeah, so uh, that's actually really difficult. Uh, over in Europe, we, 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 we're we just starting to do threat modeling. And um, Adam Showstack, as an example, came mm -hmm. over and did a presentation at Brucon uh, last year. Um, brilliant presentation, really, really smart chap. Um, but this was so new to people. You know, we, we, we're not there in Europe on, on threat modeling. Well, I mean, yeah, um, you're still driving on the wrong side of the road, so I, I, I yeah. get that. I get that. Yeah, yeah, we're on the short bus. You know. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> uh, hey, hey, now, so, Paul, in, in, in Western Europe, they're not driving on the left-hand side of the road. <laughs> that's that's right. It's just, it's just my little island. Yes. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I see organizations doing that, um, but, but very rarely, and very rarely well. Um, I think... You know, to, to me, I, you know, maybe it's because I'm an idiot, but um, I, I kind of look at um, threat modeling as, as something that's incredibly complex that you spend so much time focusing on when, you know, in reality, your infrastructure is burning down because you've not fixed the foundational issues. You know, you, the amount of people I sit in front of that say, oh, yeah, we're, we're buying this threat intelligence feed or yeah, we're starting to do threat modeling, yet I ask simple questions about how well they're doing security and they can't answer them. So, you know, whilst that's really interesting and whilst, you know, the, the latest bug is really cool, to, to me, that's kind of any relevance when you're actually not fixing the foundational issues. If we look at the uh, Verizon Data Breach Report, that came out a few weeks ago. You know, there, were, there were vulnerabilities being used from 1999. No, I think that was an, an anomaly. I just yeah, agree with you there. There was I, like 14 of them. Something, so. was, something was wrong. I spend probably more time than I should analyzing CVE data. And <laughs> okay. uh, not to give <laughs> too much away about what I do at my day job, but I spend a fair amount and I'm going to spend more. Uh, as well, but I and I looked at the CVEs that they talked about in that report, and that was some kind of anomaly. I don't know if it was an error in their reporting, or yeah. their data set, or a combination of the two. Um, and I've spoken to people who live, eat, and breathe CVE, and they they tended to agree with me as well. So I hate to challenge yeah, you on that, Gavin, no, but no, no. challenge on that. I, I I think it was an an anomaly. Yeah, but cool. Paul, you got to let him finish because that's actually not the point. Oh, God, I have no idea what my point was originally. But, uh, so, <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, See, John, I know Gavin. But, 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 I know that he had no point. No, no, no. no. I do, I do you, you did come around to a really good, really good, really yeah, good. Yeah, you were, you were going somewhere good, Gavin. I'll, yeah, I'll give yeah, you that. Cool. Yeah, so, sorry. Uh, I'll uh, stop being uh, a dick. Go ahead. Uh, but, <laughs> mate, no, I'm just lying. I won't, but go ahead. In the outfit. You know, you, uh, uh, as I said, you should have the, uh, the bejeweled chalice as well. I'm quite afraid you I know. I need a different glass. You know, for for um, you know, for for a lot of organisations, it, it, it seems weird that they're focusing on the latest greatest threat, yet they still have all of these vulnerabilities just sitting there waiting to be exploited. You, know, you look at, yeah, you know, I, I always say, uh, uh, you know, the, the biggest threat 
to security today is not APT, it's actually apathy. You know, th- th- these guys are breaking into infrastructures, you know, not using the latest, greatest zero day. You know, in reality, they're using, you know, very old uh, vulnerabilities that have been around for quite some time. You know, attackers are quite lazy. They're going to use things that are easy, uh, that they know exist, that they know haven't been patched. Uh, they're not going to spend all their time trying to find the latest, greatest thing. So you know, quite often I think we're focusing on the wrong thing. We need to focus on fixing the foundational issues first uh, and, then, and then starting to do the more interesting, glamorous, you know, latest zero day like uh, you know, K-codes right. or... Uh, Gavin, uh, you're, you're dragging us here, Gavin. You're dragging us here and you're begging me to ask the question. Oh, no, wait, at, Paul. Go ahead, Joff. Oh, I want to be a first? cheerleader for a minute. I could not agree more. You made a point, Gavin, about... Um, the SANS top 20, um, and it really does come back to that. Everybody, before they get on the bandwagon of the latest APT, this, that, and the other sexy technology with threat intel and everything else, they've got to do their basic hygiene, and too much of that is not happening. Yeah. Uh, and basic hygiene is everything. It, it, yeah. it builds a foundation that is so much more robust once you get through the – and I think SANS top 20 is a very good list to look at. Once you get through those basic things – um, mm-hmm. Back to those those first principle questions we were asking. What data am I trying to protect? Where is it? What are my assets on the network? Where are they? What am I in control of? What is this ship doing? Those things, people not they've they don't have a handle on anymore, and that that's the biggest problem. Before you even get anywhere close to these advanced topics, okay, I'll get off my soapbox now. So, then, but so after people do that, I think that one of the questions that they most often ask is, well. Now, even if I have the capabilities to find all these vulnerabilities, how do I prioritize fixing them? Even if I know where all my assets are and I know where all my vulnerabilities are, that list is way long. How do I figure out what my prioritization is? Uh, Yeah, I I come across that quite a lot. So uh, one of my favorite questions when I go and visit um, prospects or customers is um, how do you measure the effectiveness of your vulnerability management program? And the answer I always get is uh, we count the amount of vulnerabilities we have, mm-hmm. which is a shitty measure of mm-hmm. you know, how vulnerable you are. It's like, it's like saying oh, we caught 15,000 pieces of malware. You know, it's a ridiculous measure. Um, and you know, I think that if we focus on having rapid deployment of patches on the on the most easily exploitable um, remote code execution type vulnerabilities um, and get rid of those things first, then we'll be in a very good place. Let's measure how quickly we get rid of those and also measure the impact of the business of doing so. Um, and then and then start to deal with the, the more esoteric vulnerabilities that no one's ever going to use in a month of Sundays. Um, yeah, but, but make but sure that, that it's not just patches. Make sure that it's vulnerabilities because a weak yeah. password or weak configuration mm. is the totally same agree. thing as yeah, totally or agree. highly critical vulnerability. Yeah, totally agree. I mean, yeah, if we got rid of local admin on mm. Windows systems, we'd mitigate 90 plus percent of the vulnerabilities on Windows, yet we still see that constantly. But, you know, and, and I totally agree with you, Paul. I think, you know, SANS... Uh, going back to SANS again, you know, that's uh, SANS control number three, right? Uh, weak configuration. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we need to get hold of all of that and control all of that before we do anything else. But people don't. I, I can remember um, going in and, uh, and testing uh, systems, and I would run a simple CIS benchmark against them, and people would be like 30% compliant to it. And they would have local admin. They would have services that are running that shouldn't be. And they are huge vulnerabilities as well. Just because they don't have a flashy name, logos, and cheerleaders associated with it, they're you know, just as big as others. And I feel like, and in, 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 I know this might be somewhat controversial, I feel like those vulnerabilities and weak passwords and services running that shouldn't is something that today we can start to automate. I think that the old school... IT people like ourselves that were doing IT in the you know the nineties, we're very afraid of that because we gotten burnt by technology. But I mm-hmm. think as we look at today and we look at the landscape and how quickly services and applications and servers can be deployed, we have to have a model mm-hmm. that can automatically 
make passwords uh, you know, conform to a policy and automatically disable default and weak passwords and services that shouldn't be there. Because if we yeah. don't, we're never going to get ahead. Never. Yeah. Well, I, and this is why I quite like DevOps. Um, you know, I, I'm a good, good friend of uh, Gene Kim, you know, one mm -hmm. of the main guys uh, with DevOps. And, you know, I think if we, you know, if we accept the fact that we're now going to deploy things quickly, um, if we can just add in, we're going to deploy them securely, then we're going to be in a very good place. You know, if we uh, have a major vulnerability that we can simply, you know, uh, redo all of the systems within the environment uh, to the latest, greatest version that are secure, that have got the new patch, then, you know, we'll be a lot better. But, you know, unfortunately, we've got this, uh, you know, we've got this uh, technical, you know, technical burden that everyone's carrying uh, where they want to do DevOps, but they've also got you know, these you know, 5,000 systems that are not quite as dynamic. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think that yeah, if people just simply did the basic four controls well, i.e. well configured like your point is, Paul, and also reduced the amount of vulnerabilities, uh, and then checked frequently, which would be an amazing thing, then uh, would reduce the risk of exposure. You know, uh, to tag onto that, what I like about talking about the automation, you know, I, I've spent a lot of time in the last couple of weeks myself looking at these reports that keep coming out. We don't have enough people. There's not enough qualified people. We're going to be screwed. And I, I frankly, I don't believe any of them because we're still dealing with the same issues 20 years later that we were two decades ago. It, if, we're, if we're able to start to automate that or, or we look at DevOps, you know, what, what I like is... We're still oftentimes treating security like a silo, but the, some of these things have got to be, if you want to call it hygiene, then they have to be basic. They have to be something that, that other people can do, and it frees us up to go focus on other things. And, and I don't know if that's just an issue of communication, if it's an issue of control, if it's an issue of what uh, entirely. I, I think there's probably, it's probably a multi-part problem. But I love it when these conversations start pointing toward, yeah, let's let's empower other people to do it. Let's explain it to them. Yeah. Let's get them to buy in on it. And then let's give them tools on it. I mean, passwords are still great, but if we want people to remember multiple passwords, password managers, I guess they're greater. So, yeah, there, I think there's a lot of really good solutions. And, Paul, uh, you've, you've pointed out something I, I hadn't considered. We, maybe automation won't bite us in the ass this time. Mm. Yeah. I mean, gosh, I remember some of the early, yeah, you know what, yes, I remember getting bitten in the ass, so, yeah, maybe, maybe it's well, time. You know, one, of, one of our really previous good. guests from Tenable, Matt Alderman, and I, were the, he was the one that kind of planted that seed in my head, and I said, you know, you're, I think you're right, you're definitely on to something there, so, I, I, I well, think I'll tell you what, if somebody's be... tried it, and they, they've got it work, they should tell us, and, and let's, let's talk to them about it, or amplify it, because, you know, the other thing, too, is hey, you know, this there industry are, is There are great. vendors in the space doing that, and we'd love to have them as sponsors here on the show. So well, no, actually, there's, 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 a point, there's a point I want to interject into that. Automation, I think, I think there's a reason for this. Automation is not going to bite us in the rear end this time, I don't think, because of our, abil our ability to rapidly deploy um, a backup solution, which we didn't have before. Mm. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, yeah. well, so now, you know, the other part now you could, we say you like, could spin up a server instantly now, and that that's that's a completely different world. You're not racking and stacking and doing all that crap. You, so. you know, well, you know, what's great about that then too. Our learning loops just got a lot smaller, right? And if you're more into the DevOps, you look at all the loops and the double loops and everything. That's all great, but but if we just keep it really pedestrian, so what we're saying is we can take knowledge that we've been acquiring for 20 years and we can start testing it really small places. Because the other thing I'm kind of taken with as we talk about this in hygiene. Um, the place to start is is somewhere. Start start where you are, and and make make a difference because you know the thing we also talk about with momentum and everything else. If you start making a difference where you can and it's successful, then you can spread that better, right? Like we don't have to solve. Uh, I've got a major enterprise network with four thousand servers in it and uh, unknown mobile. Yeah. Okay, then don't try to solve four thousand. Go figure out what's either highest priority. Or somebody who's most willing to work with you and start there. Does that make sense, Gavin? Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, and if yeah, if more people did that, that'd be excellent. And there was a there's a trend for the uh, a couple of years ago of adversary ROI. It was all about you know figure out where the target yeah. would be 
uh, and then implement the controls on that first. And you know, whilst the model might have been slightly flawed, I, I really like the approach of, okay, so I've got 4,000 systems. If somebody broke into the infrastructure, where would they target? Let's fix that thing first. And, and I'm not yep. talking about just layering on tons of different controls. You know, I'm talking about uh, being able to rapidly deploy patches to those systems. You know, if, well, you know you what know, I find I've fascinating? I just... Go, go I, I don't. I don't mean to interrupt you. I apologize, but I, I just want to comment on that because the other thing I look at a lot lately is visualization, and yeah. and sometimes I get the sense that we feel like, well, we ask them where the assets are, and they don't. They don't tell us. Yeah, guys, they don't know. Um, and yeah. so if we can help somebody, if 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 we can work with our partners in the business to identify what their priorities are in terms of what creates value for the organization, and then we can visualize it. Uh, Gavin, and what sparked this was when you said, I don't necessarily mean more controls around it. You know what I find most times? We can simplify the process. We can help them see things that they didn't see. And then instead of us having to do that threat modeling or come up with everything that could go wrong, just ask them. Hey, guys, in this path, what concerns you? What's tripped you up already? What are you worried about? Or what should you be worried about? Teach us. Then you have a good dialogue conversation. Sometimes it doesn't even take more controls. It just takes a clarification of the pathway. And, and then we can reduce a lot of stuff. Like ultimately we could have less controls and the end result is we have a higher level of confidence in it. The business moves faster. Oh, yeah. so we weren't a cost center that told everybody no. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah, yeah, and it's quite interesting. You know, it, it, I've been uh, working on visualization of of key metrics for quite a while, and you know, I did a, a sub project at Tripwire. I say a sub project. I basically embezzled money on my expenses to hire a BI guy to to create visualization for me. And you know, what was really interesting was you know, as soon as I actually got a BI guy in to look at the data that I was trying to visualize. Yeah, he was like, oh, dude, this is so easy. I don't, why are you struggling with this? You know, you're, you're like the short bus of analytics here. You know, and, <laughs> and, and, yeah, and so uh, yeah, we created this really cool visualization of key metrics that would matter to the business and then made it interactive. We used Rombi, which is this really cool iPad template. Uh, and you know, we uh, focused on you know, what six metrics really matter to the business, you know, patch rate, uh, scan coverage and you know a plethora of others uh, and then visualize that in a really interactive way so anybody could open their iPad look at that and say oh I can see that in Germany we've got a very low patch rate why is that maybe it's the right thing but why is that uh, let's understand what the issue is there and can we address it or can we not and uh, you know, are they doing something different? Why are they doing it different? But you know, unfortunately, that that visualization and surfacing of the right data is often lacking in in in, in, in infrastructure. You know, just like you know, harking back to the original topic of of assets. You know, pe people just don't know what they have, and uh, they don't know how to demonstrate that they have that vision that that um, uh, insight into the the infrastructure. Yeah. <clears throat> Gavin, are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? I am indeed, sir. Have you prepared for this five questions? So actually, quite interesting. Every time I hear uh, your podcast, which I do frequently, well, and uh, Maharin is asleep next to me, hence the uh, <laughs> wake up Maharin um, uh, meme, um, I always think, why, didn't, why do these guys never prepare their their answers and then i've realized i'm in exactly the same position so uh, <laughs> nice yeah. so gavin three words to describe yourself uh, uh impatient. That's those are just sounds yeah, yeah. <laughs> in, in, impatient fierce soft if you were a serial killer what would be your weapon of choice well uh, I, I would say something like uh, downing planes through uh, the uh, entertainment system, but that probably end, make me end up on a list. So uh, maybe just, <laughs> maybe oh, just a shot. You're on a them. list now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Good knowing you. <laughs> Is that your answer? Yeah. Okay. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Uh, Adventures in Vendorland. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Always go first. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. 
Uh, Elon Musk, because he's an incredibly clever chap and also quite minted. Um, and then uh, Julie Andrews as Mary Poppins, or... That's an excellent, excellent, very British answer. Yeah, I'm digging yeah. Julie yeah. Andrews. Wow. Or, 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 or she's quite strict, so maybe missed out fire. But yeah. basically someone that will also look after me, whilst Elon is out earning my inheritance. There you go. Uh, well, you can find Gavin's blog at codifysecurity.com. And, of course, Gavin works with the wonderful uh, team at Tenable, uh, where I work as well. So uh, I get to, Gavin's actually on my exact team uh, at Tenable. Uh, although with the time difference, it's tough to have quality time. You just gonna have to come across the pond and come hang out, Gavin. I, I will do so. Thank you very much for the time. Yes, and if you want to stay on for stories of the week, Gavin, we'd love to have you. Will do, no problem. Alrighty. Well, we're gonna take a short break. Come back and talk about our stories for this week, which will talk about jamming logs. So stay tuned. <laughs> 